Hi, everybody. This is Bob Olson with Afterlife TV. This is where we search for evidence of life after death, and we ask some questions that are uh, related to the afterlife. Today's question is going to be, can loss be a catalyst for spiritual awakening or spiritual growth, however you want to say it? Um, we got a person who can really answer that question because I think loss in his life, a significant loss, is has changed his life in many ways, and he's written a book about it. Uh, I'll show it to you now. It's called Soul Shift. His name is Mark Ireland. Subtitle is Finding Where the Dead Go. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but anyways, welcome, Mark. You know, it's exciting for me to have you here. Thanks, thanks for coming. I appreciate being here, Bob. Thanks for having me. I, I got to tell you, you know, I, I feel like... Um, there are some similarities, not a lot, but there's some similarities between our journeys, and and uh, so I think it's going to be fun having this conversation along the way. Uh, I always get excited when you know you share somebody something with somebody, even though there are some details that are that are quite different. Why don't we just start off by a a answering that one question? You know, do you think that that uh, loss can be a catalyst for spiritual awakening or spiritual growth? I definitely think that's the case, um, not only with myself, but other people that I've met uh, since going through a loss myself, and we'll get into more detail on that later, it was the loss of my youngest son. But it makes you take inventory of your life and what, what, it's, what the time is being spent on and, and what your goals and ambitions are. And sometimes I, I think people, um, after going through that inventory, they really realize that maybe they were focusing most of their attention and their energy on things that weren't as important, things that are maybe important in, through the worldly eyes, if you will, world, uh, the worldview of uh, material gain and or, you know, job and career kinds of things, mm. uh, rather than, you know, family and friends and helping other people and, and being um, proactive in terms of causes that benefit uh, people around the world. Yeah. And, you know, and, and having said that, uh, I, I love the line that you had. I think it was in the second or the, or the last chapter, second to the last or the last chapter. Um, and you talked a bit about this and you and of course you said, you know, I would give up. This is I'm paraphrasing here, but I would give up all the spiritual growth that I've had as a result of this to get my son back, you know, uh, and yet you were still able to appreciate the growth that you have had. So. Well, that's the human part of me. You know, there's that yearning and want that you'd, you'd like to have that. But at the end of the day, you realize that really this is path, or at least I see it as the path that I was supposed to go down because it kind of kick-started me into some work um, and providing help and information to other folks to help them along their path, which yeah. is broader and bigger than myself and my family. Well, before we talk about your loss, let's just tell us a little bit about who you were, what kind of person you were, what you were, you know, maybe up to um, uh, before you had this this tragedy in your life. Sure. And I don't want to characterize it as though I didn't have any spirituality in my life at all. Because yeah. I did. In fact, I was raised by a father who I'll touch on later, who was a, not only a, a psychic medium, but a minister as well. And so that element was there, and I saw great evidence that gave me confidence in there being more than just a physical reality. But I wasn't focused on that through my adult life. I, went, I didn't really follow the same path as, as my father. I ended up going to college and then uh, getting married at a young age, getting into the business world and kind of climbing the ladder. So prior to losing my, son, my youngest son, it was a, I was in the corporate world, uh, striving for you know uh, advancement, more money, and and all those kinds of common things that people go after in this world, and uh, was attaining some of those things right at that time. In fact, I had switched positions just three weeks prior to that uh, cataclysmic event. Oh, and 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 it says uh, in the back of the book that you were an advertising executive. Some some people think that's about the farthest you can get from spirituality. <laughs> Thanks to all the advertising messages that we see, what is it, five thousand times a day or something? Is something crazy? But but no, uh, I'm joking here, of course. But really, that when you're in that kind of a world, you're not sitting down with uh, with your your coworkers talking about these kinds of subjects, are you? 
Not too much. Uh, it's interesting, though, uh, within that company, which I no longer am with, the company I worked with at that time was very supportive of me during that. And subsequent to the publication of my book, I actually um, put the book out there and shared it with my boss and some senior vice presidents and high-level people. Uh, you know, I knew it was kind of a, a risk to myself to share some of those concepts with them. Yeah. Uh, but they actually had uh, glowing feedback, and a couple of them wrote reviews on Amazon. Oh, that's awesome. You know, it's one of the things I learned over the years. You know, there's probably a lot of people who watch Afterlife TV who who never tell their coworkers about it. You know what I mean? They just don't feel safe in that way, you know, exp expressing, you know, this interest that they have. And yet, um, so there's a lot of people who are sort of in the closet have an interest in, uh, in spirituality, spiritual growth, the afterlife, what have you. Um, and they kind of do it alone or they do it with just a few friends and not too many. And it's, uh, it's situations like what you had and especially where you went and wrote a book and became very open uh, about your experiences that uh, get, get people talking about it in ways that they might never have before. Is that, was that sort of your experience? Yeah, and you also get to a point where it's like, what do I have to lose? You know, I've already been through the worst thing you could go through. So yeah, yeah. it's like, maybe this is important and I need to stick my neck out. Maybe um, that's a change in me that needed to take place that's to right. be very open. Totally. All right. So, you know, the most difficult part of this interview for me, at least, is, you know, because I, I have such compassion for people. Empathy, I guess, is really the word uh, when I hear about their loss. It's one of the reasons that I do what I do. But uh, tell us about uh, the the loss in your life that really became the catalyst that we're talking about. Absolutely. Um, my youngest son, Brandon, was going to go on a hike back in January of 2004 and I'd actually been on the road traveling with that new job the prior week. I came home on a Friday night and uh, was anxious to see him and my wife. My older son by that point had moved out of the house and was on his own. Okay. But uh, I walked in the front door and it, interestingly coming home from the airport I'd thought about stopping for a bite to eat but something compelled me to go straight home. I don't know just like this inner gut feeling like no go straight home tonight. Wow. And I did. And I walked in the front door, and the first place I went was back to Brandon's room. And I figured, ah, he'll be at a movie or whatever. But he was laying there in bed watching TV, and we, he just smiled really big. And I walked over and gave him a hug. We didn't even say a word. And then, uh, and so it was just like a kind of a homecoming feeling. Yeah. And then I went over to, and saw my wife. Um, the next morning. We got up, and Brandon had mentioned wanting to go on a hike with some friends. And he hiked all the time because we live in Scottsdale, Arizona, at the base of the McDowell Mountains, which are fairly good-sized you know, desert mountains, very pretty area. But this particular day, I felt more uneasy than usual. It was going to be a little bit bigger hike. But aside from that, there was something in my gut that just didn't feel right. And I ended up... Um, a short time after talking to him about the hike, I sat down at my computer and I was doing some things and I almost felt like a, a premonition kind of thing. I don't know how to describe it. I just felt like there was a presence there and in my gut I didn't hear any words or see any visions. I just felt like there was an imminent danger to Brandon. Mm. Now I didn't want to overblow this, but I did tell him, um, you know, asked him not to go. And you know, it was a windy day and I said, you know, it's a windy day, you really shouldn't go. And um, he was 18 years old. There was no turning him back. <laughs> right. As he got in the car with his buddies to leave, I said, please don't go, Brandon. And he huh. said, we're, we're going, Dad. Huh. And so uh, I kind of had this edgy feeling the rest of the day. He and his buddies took off. My wife and I ended up going to the end of the town to see a nephew and my brother who were visiting. And at the time, um, I just couldn't take my mind off of this worry. And later that afternoon, I, my cell phone was ringing, and I thought it might be Brandon. I was hopeful because I left a note for him on the kitchen counter. But it was actually a call from my older son who was at work, and he was calling us because he'd received a, kind of a distress call from one of the boys who was with Brandon on the side of the mountain. They said he had been not feeling well. He was dizzy and passing out. And they'd asked him to call 911 uh, for a helicopter. So my older son, Stephen, was disraught he was at work so he called me to kind of asked me to do it and so i did and uh i ended up getting a hold of them and uh, the officials and they they said they were going to send a helicopter i didn't really know what the nature was of what was going on i did talk to one of the boys briefly and he just said that 
Brandon had been uh, feeling lightheaded. He felt like his heart was beating rapidly and his, his uh, limbs were somewhat numb. And so we drove home. It was probably a 40-minute drive or something like that. Mm. And by the time we got up to, we were driving up the road toward the base of the mountain near where we live, and I could see this horde of spectators and ambulance and the helicopter off in the distance. It was just like a heart-wrenching thing. Yeah. And uh, as soon as we parked, we told the officials who we were, and they brought us in and introduced us to a chaplain. And once that introduction took place, I was pretty concerned. Yeah. I figured it wasn't to tell me good news. Um, a short time later, they had told us that Brandon had passed, and then they brought his body down off of the mountain. We were able to view it in the back of an ambulance, and I'd say that was uh, the low point of, of my life. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you, you know, you explain this in the book. I probably don't have a lot of time to explain it here, but, you know, what was it that he that actually took his life? Well, this is interesting because at first they would tell us nothing. We, we didn't know. It was probably a week and a half later that I got the autopsy results. But in the interim, I don't know if you want me to go into this yet, um, I'd mentioned that my father and uncle, my father was a psychic medium. Yeah, talk about, well, well, yeah, talk about the uncle's story because that is pretty fascinating, yeah. So my um, father had long been passed by this time, but my uncle uh, was still alive. He lived down in Tucson, which is a couple hours away. And he had similar abilities, um, was not necessarily as famous as my father was during his prime, but very gifted as well. Mm -hmm. And I talked to my uncle right after the passing, and um, he said, is there anything I can do for you? And I said, well, yeah, if there's anything you can share that you get um, about Brandon's well-being, you know, I'd love to hear it. And it was a day or two later, I was in the mortuary, and my cell phone rang, and it was my uncle on the other end of the line. And he said, Mark, I have something to share with you. He said, you know, last, last night I tried to connect, I couldn't get anything. But this morning I was doing my meditation and your dad came to me and he wanted you to know that when Brandon passed, he was a little confused, but he met Brandon there to help him adjust and to cross over. And uh, he wanted you to know that you're the best parents he ever could have had. Now those are the things we like to hear, but what came along with that was some evidence. And he said, um, he wanted you to know Brandon's death was caused by a lack of oxygen that caused cardiac arrest. And so it was about three days to a week later, something like that, that I spoke to the physician who performed the autopsy, and she had said that uh, Brandon had apparently had a severe asthma attack, which had lowered his blood oxygen levels to the point of causing cardiac arrest. So my uncle hit the nail on the head with the cause of death before I even had an official ruling on that. Did you suspect uh, asthma to, to begin with? Had he had really severe asthma attacks uh, in the past? And so you sort of thought maybe that was the cause? Well, we had concerns about the possibility of asthma. He'd had asthma, but never that severe. Okay. And he was on a preventative drug called Advair, mm -hmm. which is supposed to kind of head off attacks and so forth. Um, and none of these, uh, the descriptions from the boys who were with him matched up with any asthma attack he'd ever had, like the, you know, the rapid heartbeat or the numbness of limbs or those kinds of things. Yeah. So, and he even had his inhaler with him and took it, but it was ineffective. Mm -hmm. um, but he, uh, I don't think from the description that his friends provided that really felt like a, an asthma attack. He, he would, felt like he was wheezy or whatever, but um, it just seemed like these other symptoms were more pronounced than the you know difficulty in breathing was uh let me just say now i you know your father we're going to talk about that next your father was a uh a well-known a famous psychic really um and medium you said and, and your uncle obviously is as well uh did you have any abilities uh, at all growing up was this something that was passed on to you as well I think it's late in there in all of us, maybe to varying degrees. I think it does, it's more pronounced in certain family lines. So part of it may be physical and had tied to our DNA. Um, I can't say that I've ever been at the same level as my father, nor have I really strived to be. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I put more energy toward that, it could have developed. But I've had, in my case, more kind of spontaneous events. Yeah. Um, one that I noted in the book was I was dating a girl back um, years ago before I was married and had a dream one night that she, you know, was dating this other guy. And uh, I told, I was hesitant to tell her about it. She goes, no, no, tell me about the dream. 
and I d described the guy's physical appearance and then told her his first and the last name, Bob Dooley, and she said, I dated a guy named Bob Dooley that looked just like that in Kansas. So where that came from, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but it's not like something that happens all the time. All right, so I, I know we're getting a little off story here, but it's sort of some backstory, and, and it's going to come in, so we'll b talk about it now. Let's talk about your father. You know, uh, below below this video, I'm going to I'm gonna put a link to the YouTube videos of your father. There's a part one and a part two when he is on the Steve Allen show. Um, are those yours? Are you the one who put those up? or does... I did post those, and part two is actually even better than part one, especially for skeptics, because there's some evidence in there that you really have to look at and think about. Yeah. Um, for so one thing, I'm, no, go ahead. I'm just gonna say. So I'm gonna put those on there. But I, I do, I do want to say it's, it's fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating to watch. And honestly, I don't know what's going on there. But just looking at those videos, assuming, and I do, I'm assuming everything's legit. All right. Um, he's gonna be one of the best psychics I've ever seen. I mean, it, it just absolutely amazing. So people have to watch that video. Uh, but go ahead, say what you're going to say. Well, you know, I think the people that knew him felt that he was the best, or at least one of the very best, at least of our time. Mm. And um, the, the second video includes some things that you'll want to know. For, for one thing, a lot of people that are skeptical about it will say, you know, this is too good to be true. There's trickery going on somehow. Yeah, yeah. And they would assume either he can see, which he's all blindfolded and taped in a way that he, could, he can't see. I mean, I, I saw this so many times. I saw him take it off. And that it was still sealed tight against his eyelids and took, pulled his eyelashes off and all oh. that kind of stuff. Yeah. But aside from that, then they think he had plants in the audience or something. But well, what you see on the Steve Allen video is, you know, he addresses probably a dozen people. But in an actual demonstration in a normal environment, he would probably, you know, talk to a group of 100 and he would reach 50 to 70 people. How do you have 50 to 70 plants that provides the same level of detailed information that you see in this video? Um and I've had some personal, they're anecdotal stories, but people have come back to me with some amazing stories that are, are, are just very confirming, um, you know, and can't be explained away. I can share some of those if we have time. Yeah. And what's, you know, what's amazing I mean, about him, too, doing this is that he was a minister. So, you know, there, I mean, there are some people out there who will say that, you know, we have no right to be playing around with this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And yet here was a guy who, he, he was a minister, and, and he was also, you know, using his abilities to, what was he teaching people? What were, well, he actually be, first became ordained in the spiritualist church, but that was too narrow of a focus for him, and then he eventually had his own non-denominational church called the University of Life. Ah. But he was brought up in a Christian upbringing as a Methodist, but he had deeper questions that the minister really couldn't answer, and he asked this minister these series of questions at the age of 12, as you noted in my book. I won't go through the whole dialogue. But he was a very deep thinker. And, and really the reason that he went out in the secular world and started demonstrating this stuff is because he just wanted people to, I think the most basic part of spirituality, as I see it, and my father saw it, was to think that you're more than just a physical body, that yeah. you have a soul or a spirit, and there's something there. But... You know, it was basically, you know, the core teachings that he shared were the same ones Jesus shared, and it was it was uh, founded in those teachings that Jesus shared in the New Testament. But as far as those gifts being on display, there's really mixed thoughts about that in various religious uh, denominations. I think that, you know, what's evolved over time is like, oh, that stuff's taboo, stay away from it. But if you really look in the New Testament, Jesus and his disciples are doing these things all the time. You have an example of mediumship, or I would call it mediumship, with the story of the Transfiguration, where Moses and Elijah appear in front of Jesus and the disciples report viewing this. So he's talking to dead people. And some people might say, well, that was Jesus. But in the Gospel of John, it's noted, he says, all the work I, works I do, ye shall do, and greater works than these. He encouraged his disciples to do these kinds of things. And the Apostle Paul notes the gifts of the Spirit. He details these things as a positive a series of things that we have available to us and they include things like prophecy and uh, you know I you know you can question what the definition are but one of them to me is spirit communication mm -hmm. so there there are passages that support these things and most of the admonitions come from the Old Testament in books like Leviticus which also contend that slavery is okay so 
sometimes when you look at this and you don't take things so literally, maybe you say, well, could some of those books, some parts of those books have been more product of, you know, human teaching at the time based on, you know, the lawmakers of that era who were trying to keep their people away from competing thoughts because the pagan cultures were more open to this and then the early Christians were more open to it as well. It you, appears. you really know your stuff. I mean, obviously, um, you're, you're the man to talk to when, when you get those questions from people who, who are very religious and, and have interpreted things differently. Um, I'm sure you could have some interesting conversations with them. Does this come from your being brought up by your father, or is this more something that you studied on your own before Brandon's passing? It's both, really. It started with my father because he had to explain this to people, too, yeah. um, because he was under attack at times from fundamentalists. Yeah. Um, but, you know, no matter how much ammunition you have and how, how much you know, you're never going to win some of those arguments because, some you know, that's their security blanket, and they're not going to let it go. So you just have to respect where they're at, love them for who they are, and, and let them think what they want to think. But there are a lot of people in the middle that are open-minded. There may be more, you know, uh, middle-of-the-road in their in their beliefs and they're you know somewhere between the liberal and the conservative vein so I, I I'd say my father got me started in terms of knowing some of that but I've done a lot more research and reading on my own since Brandon's passing because going into this area you know I knew it would come up this yeah. the skeptics those are the two things this you know this what some people call the super skeptics or some call the pseudo skeptics the closed-minded ones who aren't willing to investigate the evidence, um, they come in with preconceptions. Those two camps really are the ones that you have the most argumentative dialogue with. So, Yeah, yeah well, that's it. I, I always, yeah, I, I've written and, and even done a video on the same thing. Uh, I just call them the open-minded skeptics and the closed-minded skeptics, and you're right. I mean, so, all right, so, so Brandon passes. How long, I mean, now obviously you had... Um, you know, this, this information that came from your uncle. Um, how long, though, I mean, was there a, was there a period of deep grief be, be, where you were, you know, what, somewhat immobilized? Uh, or did you jump right into sort of investigating the afterlife? Where has Brandon gone, that sort of a thing? How long did it take? Well, it's interesting. The first few days to the first week were the worst in terms of the pain um, that I felt, my family felt. But it was kind of like you'd have these ebbs and flows from the high to the low points. And it was during this time, too, that I wanted to just see if I could get anything on my own. And so I'd never been really good at meditating or spent a lot of time. But I really made a focused effort over those few days to try and meditate and see if I could get any um, connection of my own. And the one thing that I do remember, and I wrote about it, was sitting quietly in a dark area where I saw these images kind of flash in my head. Um, one is of Brandon's face smiling and happy and then behind it was a cross with an oval loop at the top which I with a symbol with which I was unfamiliar so after that I thought well is this my imagination so I went on uh, Google and searched for that and I found out that that symbol is an Ankh which is an ancient Egyptian cross that predates the cross of the crucifixion and it's symbolic of physical life and eternal life so the oval loop at the top symbolizes eternal life. So I took that to mean Brandon's happy and he's gone on. Ah. So, you know, some people might say, well, that's a little fuzzy, but, you know, it was real for me. And I think that is kind of the nature of psychic medium phenomena for those who practice it on a regular basis. Sometimes it's symbolic in nature. Mm. Some people oh, declare yeah. audience, but others get, you know, mainly symbols and things. That's right. And, you know, also to put you, skeptics aside, when you're in the situation that you were in, I mean, you're pretty much grasping for anything to, to begin with. You know what I mean? So when you get a symbol, I mean, you're, you're not going to be all Mr. Close-Minded Skeptic about that. First of all, it's not somebody telling you it. It's not a third party telling you about this cross. Um, it's, you're experiencing it yourself. I mean, you, it's hard to be skeptical with, with yourself. And you get this. You're interpreting that, what you saw, and, and for its meaning, but you that's how else are we going to communicate, especially someone who wasn't communicating with uh, people in spirit on a daily basis, right? Right, and the interesting thing to me that's more validating was I got a symbol that I didn't understand, and so had I known it already, then it would be one thing, but it wasn't just sitting there in my mind like, oh, I know what this is. Yeah. 
I had to figure out what it meant. Yes. That to me was more validating than something I would have known. I totally agree. Uh, you and I think so much alike. Um, and, and that to me, that's the investigator uh, mentality, which is, a, which is a bit different than the scientist mentality. I, I've mentioned this before in other videos. Scientists are a little bit different than, than investigators. As an investigator, a logic is a, in, in reasoning is a big part of it, you know, whereas with science, uh, a lot of it is, you know, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. It's about numbers. It's about facts. It's all that sort of thing. But with investigators, we, we have to use logic and, and reasoning quite often in order to make the interpretations that we're looking for. Um, let me just ask you this. Um, what would, let's just zoom forward to the next most, uh, compelling message or, or piece of evidence that, that you got that was, that was really, uh, maybe even jarring for you, you know, great in a great, com in a great comfortable way. Um, what was the next step that you, that you had? Well, there was kind of a series of things, and then what seemed to me to be synchronicity followed, and I've, I've seen a lot of synchronicities that seem to be another kind of sign, if you will, yeah. especially when they're of very extreme nature. Yeah. Um, two weeks after Brandon's passing, I actually went to see a medium who I had known from before, and I took my son and two of Brandon's friends who had been on the mountain with him, and we each got many readings, and, and they were good. But some of the information was kind of precognitive in nature, so I couldn't really validate it at the time. Mm -hmm. But I went back later and listened to the tape. And one of the things that she said was, within six months, you're going to see Brandon uh, at your side, and he's going to be, um, like, it'll be at, at, the, at your bed or something like that. Well, it was actually six months or five months after his passing, we went on a family cruise. And it wasn't me, but it was my wife. Uh, we had just returned home from the cruise, and she was sitting at a, like a, a chair that's at the foot of our bed, um, and there, or the love seat. And um, she felt our son's presence to her right side and then shot, saw him as a shadow figure. Mm. Um, and then I ended up walking in the room and kind of breaking things up by talking. But, but what was really confirming about that was the very next day we got a call from another friend we'd loaned uh, Brandon's bass guitar to. He was a musician who was doing some recording in his home studio and Brandon had been a bassist. So this musician friend uh, asked if he could borrow the instrument. So he called and Susie answered the phone and he said, well, I've got to tell you something but I don't know how to tell you. She thought he was going to report that he dropped the bass or something and it wasn't that at all. He said, well, I was doing this recording and um, I felt this other presence in there with me. And then I saw a shadow figure out of my right peripheral vision. Mm. It was identical to what Susie described. Yeah. And he went on to say that he couldn't get rid of this. And then he saw flashes of white light. He thought he was hallucinating. So he went and had some water. He had lunch. He took a shower. He came back. But every time he sat down to work on this song, it kept happening. And he actually modified this song as a result of this experience, and he felt that he was driven to compose this song once he acknowledged by saying, okay, Brandon, what do you want? Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of interesting for my wife to have such an experience and then to have this independent report that's almost identical yeah. um, the next day without him knowing anything about her experience. That is, uh, yeah, it's it, it's amazing. Um, was Susan a little upset with you for walking in the room? <laughs> no, she actually felt she didn't want to tell me right away because she was afraid I'd feel bad. Oh, because you because you didn't have it, and oh, because you because it went away after because Brandon disappeared I, after that. I kind of disrupted. She just lost her focus, and I, she never had something like that happen before, so she didn't really know how it worked or how to facilitate it. She didn't want to lose it. And yeah, I, I wish I had taken my time coming into the room but well that's true love right there you know she's actually more worried about how you're feeling so how long did she wait before she told you it was the next day yeah yeah the, the next morning actually before she got the call and how did that make her feel i mean you know i know you're speaking for her but she felt very very comforted and very happy about it you know and yeah. i think a personal visitation is probably the best thing of all i've been with some great mediums and had great sessions but to have that direct contact, I can't imagine there's anything better. No, and for you to get these two messages, one after the other, uh, how about yourself? How, what did that do for you? Well, it was very helpful for me. Um, and then, you know, another series of synchronicities kind of happened back in February, which is just a month after Brandon's passing. I was watching the evening news here in Phoenix on the NBC affiliate, 
and they were showing um, an, an interview that was uh, about some afterlife afterlife research being done at the University of Arizona um, with uh, mediums who are being studied under single and double blind test uh, protocols. And the medium they showed at the time was Allison Dubois, who that's kind of before she hit it big because yeah. of the show Medium. And um, so they showed some of her hits with the person that she couldn't see. And I thought, well, she's pretty good. I, I, and I felt comfortable with what I saw there. I thought, I'd love to have a reading with her. I'd love to be in that lab at some point. And the very next day, I got a call unsolicited from someone in Texas who knew my father. And he said, uh, his name's Jerry Conser. He said, Mark, I know what you've been through. And I know someone who might be able to help you. Her name's Allison Dubois. <laughs> and then he gave me her phone number. Um, it turned out that he was married had been married he was an ex of uh, a woman who was allison's cousin oh so that provided a link there for me to be able to get in and see her and even though she hadn't become famous yet she you know um did have quite a following and a long wait list and i did get to eventually see her in august of that year so that was an interesting connection there what do you and make I, of it, that what do you make of that happening like you know i mean you you see the thing on tv I mean, obviously, you're thinking, hmm, you know, maybe I could get in there. And then you get this phone call. Yeah. I, and I, I, mean, I, think... that, I was eventually in that lab, too, and became a, a test sitter for an experiment that was taped for a Discovery Channel episode. Uh, there's a link to that on my website, too. But, yeah, that's like the first in a series of things where I said, this is not a coincidence. No, no. So are, are you thinking Brandon's coordinating all this or what? I kind of, in my mind, it's my dad and my son working in cahoots, you know, trying yeah. to line things up. Because I think it was uh, during the course of these things and some of the early readings, the information I got from people who knew really little about me or my circumstances that led me to believe that I was on a path that had a bigger purpose. Yeah. And it was about bringing understanding to people. So it was kind of like I had to go through this pain to be prepared for the work that I had to, had to do going forward. Good point. You know, I have a question here. You know, I'll ask it now because you kind of brought it up. You know, the question is, why would you surmise that your soul chose a life where your father is a psychic and your son passes at 18 years old? Um, first of all, you know, well, I think now I was, I was going to ask how are those two things related? It's obvious by that, by this point in the story how these two things are related. But but do you think that's possible? You know that this is sort of. You know, I was talking to Rob Schwartz, you know, or you know earlier uh, about you know, the plans that our souls made. Do you believe in that sort of thing? And do you think that's sort of what this was all about? You have a father who's a psychic. You have a son who passes at 18, and it's leading you in this direction. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up Rob Schwartz because that's the first thing I thought of when you mentioned that. But, um, <laughs> you know, I can't say I'm a hundred percent. Uh, buying into it, but I, I do lean that way. I do think that um, there's a part of us, our soul, uh, whatever, our oversoul um, that existed prior to this physical car incarnation that is kind of a, a guiding force in what we're evolving to be yeah. and has a, um, has a role in that. So I, I could see, you know, it does seem to me that I have kind of a planned path. And I think I still have free will, though, over making choices to vary off that path or whatever. But at the end, in the end game, I think you know, uh, more likely than not, you end up following that path to the end goal. You make it's kind of like a river you might have little tributaries that go off this way or that way, but at the end, they end up kind of going into the same body of water. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, what is? Where has it led you? Let's let's just jump forward a little bit. Where has it led you? What kind of work are you doing? Um, in this field well you know I'm still in the corporate world because I have to earn a paycheck to pay the bills mm. but I'm doing a lot of other things on the side you know I've, I've been doing uh, more writing and preparing to publish a second book I also got a book of my father's published that had been sitting dormant since 1973 called your psychic potential a guide to psychic development I've met with other mediums and researchers and I'm kind of, I'm not a scientist, you know, like you, but I'm very interested in seeing the science done in this area and see there's no funding for it mm. and mainstream science is staying away from it still. So there's just a handful of researchers doing it. So I've gotten to know more of them. I've conducted some experiments of my own, one involving my sister who passed in 2006 and she left behind a, a message in a sealed envelope. Um, 
and then we reached out to some mediums after the fact. So I've written a kind of a full description of that experiment. I would call it a partial success. Yeah. And maybe not a hundred percent clear success, clear cut, but uh, giving us a good roadmap maybe for f future endeavors of that sort. Yeah. Um, I'm I've launched a new uh, a support group for parents who have lost kids. I'll be putting up a website on that soon called Helping Parents Heal. And in the interim, anyone who's interested in this can find a, a group that's going to be changing its name to that. It's currently called Parents United in Loss. Okay. But um, there are other good groups like Compassionate Friends that do this sort of work, but we, we're going to be a little bit different because we're going to go beyond the limits that they've kind of set for themselves mm -hmm. to allow people to share stories that delve into what may be termed paranormal or you know spirit communication, near-death experience information, ADC, after-death communication information, and so on. Yeah. Additionally, I'm helping coordinate a conference that's going to be held in um, the Phoenix Scottsdale area, April 2012, called the International Conference on After Death Communications. We've got a great lineup of speakers from Pim Von Lummel, who's one of the top uh, authorities on near death experience research. We've got uh, Bill Guggenheim, author of um, Hello from Heaven. I think he's one of your guests. He'll be and, coming up. Uh, yeah. We've got uh, Larry Dossey. We've got uh, we've just we've got like 21 speakers and they're all experts in their field. We've got John Holland from your area. He's a Boston medium, one of the top ones there. Yeah, good friend of mine. Yeah. Yeah, he's coming out. Great. So those are some of the things I'm doing. Plus, I'm still speaking at various events. I'm going, you know, I'm doing book signings periodically and uh, uh, speaking at churches and whoever will hear me. <laughs> Let's talk about that second book that you did. I thought it was interesting the way that you got it. This, this involves your uncle again as well, does it not? How you ended up with your father's book. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, uh, I have to fast forward here to the Alison Dubois reading, which took place in August of the same year my son died. So, you okay. know, about a number of months later. Yep. One of the hits that she, one of the things she came forward with was she said, "I see your father. Um, he's showing me a book, and I think it's his book. But he's handing it to you, and it's for you to take forward. Does this make sense to you?" Well, it had been two weeks prior that someone my dad knew had apparently held on to this book for the twelve years since my father had died. I didn't even know this book existed, and um, I was out of state at the t at the time. So I gather that's why my dad gave it to this person and just said, "Hang on to this." Or maybe he knew if you're talking about this life plan thing that at the right time I'd be given the book. Yeah. So this two weeks prior to the reading with Allison Dubois, the guy just said, "Hey, your dad gave me this for safekeeping, and I just feel like I'm supposed to give it to you." So I got it at that time, and then Allison had mentioned it two weeks later, so I felt like, okay, this is part of the puzzle. Not only that book, but I have a ton of material that he's left behind, and I'm trying to figure out exactly what to do with it all and how to get it published and, mm. and how it could be helpful to people. Oh, that's so cool. There's so much serendipity going on there. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, your story takes you to to numerous other mediums, and and just for the sake of time, I and mean, we will kind of have to fast forward here. But um, what are some of the more significant lessons that you gained along the way by going to different mediums? You know, uh, obviously, I mean, some people might go to one and they'll just stick with that one. Why go anywhere else if you got a good reading? But you went to more. I, I certainly did in my in my case. You know, there tends to be this, and I know a lot of people do. They they just want to try it with other people. And one of the fascinating things that I learned very early on, you don't only have to go to a couple, is uh, you see the parallels that, that go on, but you also see the differences. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience in that. Yeah, I think that's true. I got a lot of great validations, highly specific information from all of them, and in fact, many more since that book. Um, in fact, some readings beyond the quality even of what were in the book. The best one of all isn't even in there. Um, but nonetheless, those were very, I'd say all four that are in the book are very good. And it's not just a book about the readings, you know, those are just validations. But yeah. it was striking to me to see the correlation between them. Like out of the four, like three would get the same thing in a certain area and four would get a certain thing. Um, many of them said my father was there to meet my son. I didn't know I lost my father. Mm. Didn't know I lost my son, you know. Yeah. Um, there were numerous references to um, – the manner in which he died and, and pretty accurate descriptions of how my son passed and, and things like that. So the correlation of those, but also I appreciated kind of the variation. Some, what you find too is that some you connect better with, or it's like 
it just feels very natural and like there's a very comfortable mode of communication there. Mm. But at the end of the day, I, I really don't recommend that people o OD on mediumship readings because mm. I think you can become a, an addict to that, if you will, and it becomes a crutch and you have to kind of figure out how to go forth on your own. So having one periodically, I think, is a healing thing, but it's like anything else that comes down to balance. And, 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 and I mean, you know, we're talking about awareness here. A part of the awareness is to recognize, okay, they are not dead. They still exist. They've, you know, their consciousness survives. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the first things that I tell people who have lost a loved one, you know, people that I know personally is, just talk to them. You know, I, I remember some of the first readings that I got, my father kept coming through saying, you know, you know I'm there. You feel that I'm there. Just talk out loud to me. You know, <laughs> did you did you ever get that from Brandon? You know, um, I, I have had that. Like one medium, Jamie Clark, I think said, you know, why are you coming to a medium for this? You you could talk to me. Yeah. yeah. So I do. I send these thoughts out and talk to them in my mind. And sometimes I'll get signs because I'm a little bit dense. Um, here, this is actually the most recent event. This is just um, back on January 10th, which was the eighth anniversary of Brandon's passing. Wow. We had actually had a little get together uh, with my son Stephen, his girlfriend, and two of the boys who had hiked with Brandon on that day. And um, we had this little powwow and enjoyed the evening. And then at the end of the night, I decided to just sit down and try and meditate, even though it's not my big greatest strength, <laughs> just to see if I could form some sort of connection on whatever level. Yeah. And so while there, I got relaxed enough that I actually started seeing some things. And I don't always see things, but in my mind, I saw a bunch of relatives. And it was just like scrolling from one to the next. I saw uh, two grandmothers, my sister, uh, mother-in-law, and then eventually um, an outline of Brandon. I didn't really see his face, and then I, my father. But during this, I was like, okay, is this my imagination or is this real? But... All of a sudden, for several minutes, three to five minutes, I started hearing loud noises throughout the house, like popping, cracking sounds, and there was no physical explanation for them. There was no wind outside. There was no stress on the structure of my home. There was no running water. My wife is in bed. So there was no physical explanation for these noises. So to me, I took that to say, okay, they gave me the sign that they were able to provide that I could accept. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. And again, when you have that kind of an experience, I mean, how does it make you feel when you're when it's over? You know, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, naturally, you're, you're looking for something valuing. We we'd all like to have our loved one materialize right in front of us, yes. give them a hug. But you have to be grateful for what you for what you get. And That's I think right. The other lesson in this is just to you know, as I assess what's important in my life, I, I value and I'm thankful for those things I do have in my life going forward, and and I appreciate those things more than ever. Yeah, well, that's right. Um, you know, actually, I'm going to ask you a question about that as our final question. But um, I want to get back to the premonition because this reminds me a little bit. You know, I've talked to a lot of people who have lost loved ones, and uh, a lot of people worry that, you know, they could, they feel like they might have been able to prevent their loved ones passing in some way, especially when it's a tragic passing, you know. And, um, and here, this is a perfect example of that. You, you have this premonition-like feeling that, oh, this isn't a good idea. You actually ask him twice not to go. And obviously, like you say, he's 18, he's a big boy. He says, I'm, I'm go we're going, right? Um, do you ever second-guess yourself afterwards? Now, not, I mean immediately after, not where you're at now, because where you're at now, you have a much bigger picture, right? This was, this was the way it was meant to be. But, but immediately... Um, you know, you, you can probably recognize how people might question themselves in a situation like that. Oh, if I had just made him stay, right? What advice would you have for people that feel that way? Well, I can't say with certainty that I could or could not have changed things. I think there are cases where you get a premonition or a, premonition or a feeling and you can alter the results. Even my father, he noted in some of his writing cases of that where there was one Sunday where he was going to go to church, but he knew he was going to be in a car accident. So he intentionally took an alternate course, but he still got in the car accident. Oh. So in my case, I, I feel that, and I can't prove this, but I feel that this was an inevitable thing that was going to happen. So maybe I stopped running that day, and maybe it would have been the next. Mm -hmm. Maybe he wouldn't have gone so easily, you know, and that would have been worse. Yep. Um, so I can't say definitively in which cases you can predict and ch change the outcome of something and which you cannot. 
Um, I just know for me after the fact that I came to that conclusion. And I, but I, I did, you know, many times look back and say, wow, I wish I'd have, you know, not, not let him go or found some way. And I even had a scheme for how I was considering doing it. Yeah. Because an employee of mine lived across the street from a pretty famous rock musician named Dave Mustaine. And um, my son was a fan, and I thought, well, I could tell him I've got a meeting scheduled today. But then try and arrange it at the last <laughs> minute, not knowing if it would come together. And right. I didn't do that. So if I felt any guilt at all, which I really didn't feel a lot of guilt. Um, right. yeah. And some people, I think it's normal. People feel guilt even when they shouldn't. Yeah. Any shred of guilt I had was for not doing that. But at the same time, I would have been dishonest in doing that. And, it, you know, yeah. he, he was old enough to make his mind up about what he wanted to do. I mean, I, you know, I don't know your relationship with your son, um, but... I mean, it's also possible if a parent, if a father had tried to do that, they might have gotten in an argument, and he might have gone anyways, and then it would, and that would have been the last, you know, you know, that argument would have been the last memory that he had. So, yeah, being honest, letting people have some some freedom, especially when they're an adult, uh, at least you can live with that with peace, knowing that that's how it ended. Sure, we wouldn't have gotten in a fight, but still, yeah, he probably would have wanted to meet the guy, but oh yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, in that particular case, but I mean, if you would said you're not going, yeah, <laughs> tried yeah. to handcuff him. Um, what? Because we're running out of time. I, I don't know how this went so fast. I can't even believe how fast it went. Um, we're running out of time. So I, I want to get back to that one thing that I want that I mentioned just a minute ago. Uh, you had touched upon, which is. Can you tell us how Brandon's passing and all this, these experiences that you have had, and there's so many more in the book, you know, there's just so many more that you, you talk about with much greater detail, and, and it's so interesting, um, but how it has changed your life. How are you different today than you were before this happened? And, I, and, and I'm going to finish that off by just saying a lot of people um, – not a lot, but a few people will say on, a, on our Facebook page, you know, why are you thinking about the afterlife? You should just be focusing on life. And to me, it's learning about the afterlife teaches us ab about life. And so, and I, so is that the case for you? Yeah, and I'd say the life and the afterlife are a continuum. It's not like, oh, it's this or that. It's just our next state of experience um, um, after we pass. And I think... If you haven't lost a kid or somebody very close to you, it's a little hard to understand how debilitating that can be. Mm. So people have to get to a point where they can cope and go on and have some hope. So, you know, it's like I said with that parents organization, something called uh, Helping Parents Heal. Yeah. Well, if people can't heal or have some hope to carry on, they're not going to be able to focus on this life. They can't even function or feed themselves. Mm. You know, you don't want to eat. You don't want to sleep. Uh, you're miserable. So... I think those things do correlate, and I, I just say that you know my life now. What's different about it is that my what's most important are relationships, are trying to educate and bring information and help to people, and I really uh, enjoy that. In fact, almost I'd say almost once a week I get contacted by someone who knows someone who's lost a kid and they want to talk or connect in some way. So I relish that, and I give them the time to do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis to the extent that I can. Yeah. Um, but you know, so I'm trying to broaden the scope of what I'm doing to reach more and more people and even build an organization where it could, uh, could be a domino effect where people come in, they need the healing, they get healed. And then all of a sudden they're a resource to other people. Yeah. When, when parents lose a kid, the people they want to talk to most are those who have been through the same thing. And especially people who have healed, and are together and are happy and have found joy in life. Because you wonder in the beginning stages, will I ever find joy in life again? Yeah. And you yeah. can. Right. Well, you just know it at the time. And your, your story is a perfect example of that. Uh, we thank you. For, I want to thank you for sharing your story the way you have uh, with us today and, and in your book uh, and, and in your future book. I look forward to that. Please let us know when that's coming out. Uh, I want people to go to your website. What's your website? It's uh, markirelandauthor.com, M-A-R-K, I'm sorry, M-A-R-K, Ireland like the country, author.com, okay. all a string of letters. Okay, and we'll have that linked up uh, below this video as well. Uh, your two books right now, Soul Shift and Your Psychic Potential, which is the one that your father actually wrote, correct? Right. 
I wrote the forward to it, but he wrote the book. That's cool. Um, and uh, and then uh, anything else that you wanted to just mention that uh, people make them aware of? Just uh, if they go to my website, they'll see a link at the bottom for the conference that's coming up here this spring called the International Conference on After Death Communications. Um, anyone who's got the time and resources to come, I think we'll really get a lot out of it because we're bringing a cross section of evidence for the afterlife. Mm. Um, and we're bringing, you know, people that are coming to that or some will be bereaved people and some will just be inquisitive or curious about uh, the evidence and or maybe on a journey. So um, that's, I'd say, the, kind of the primary thing today that I'd focus on. And uh, mm. we'd love to have you come to the event if you can make it. You know, you got a great variety of people as well. I mean, you, you know, you got Larry Dossey, you know, very scientific minded, you know, just, I mean, excellent mind in that way. Really great for, for the skeptics. You know, then you have other people who like the psychic mediums that you have. Uh, John Holland, it was Jamie, what, what's his name? Uh, Jamie Clark. Jamie Clark. And, I mean, and, maybe, they've, I, maybe they've never been skeptical in their life, you know, but... They're doing their thing, and and so you, you have all these people in between, you know what I mean? So I think you've got a great range of people there that's going to satisfy the needs uh, that everybody has when they're trying to learn about the afterlife. Yeah, the other thing that we have is that we have a, a few mediums that are coming there that are available for readings. So if people are there and, and they're going to presentations, but they want a reading from a top medium, we have some really good ones there they can rely on and schedule time with. That's great. Well, Mark, uh, thank you very much for coming, and I hope uh, we'll get to talk to you again in the future about your next book, and I wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Bob. I look forward to it. Thanks.